On today's episode, we are joined by Matt Streichel, or SB Fishing, as many of you probably know him from YouTube, not to talk about bass, but to actually talk about muskie. So you're going to hear Matt and I talk about the challenges and the lessons that we think can be learned from switching it up from your normal bass fishing and targeting a new species like muskie. All that and more on this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, sponsored by TopFishingDeals.com. Updated daily to provide you with savings on all your favorite gear. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Tackle Talk, a very special episode. We have a very special guest today, Matt Streichel of SB Fishing is going to join us. But first, as always, Tackle Talk is brought to you by TopFishingDeals.com. If you're looking for gear, if you're looking for rods, reels, line, apparel, kayaks, boots, waders, whatever you need to go fishing, they're going to have it on TopFishingDeals.com. And even better, they're going to find those websites all over the internet where that gear that you're looking for anyway is on sale. So all that stuff adds up. We've talked about it a million times. If you can save a dollar here, two dollars here, five dollars here, that adds up over the course of a month, a year, two years, three years. So much money that you can save by buying the stuff you want to buy anyway. Just make sure you're buying it from the correct website. And the correct website is the website that is going to have it on sale as opposed to retail price. So that's the name of the game here. Save as much money as you can while not altering really what you need to buy. It's just You know, if you're a big Z-Man Chatterbait person and they're normally five bucks at your local store, Top Fishing Deals is going to find that website where they're, you know, $3.99 or $4.25 or whatever it is. All that little stuff adds up so much. And you're going to look on that website and you're going to see things that it kind of clicks in the back of your mind. You're like, yeah, I probably do need to restock on this. I should do it while they're, you know, a couple bucks off or 20% off, whatever it is. So make sure before you go shopping, whether it's in person, whether it's, you know, you're going to go shopping online, check www dot top fishing deals dot com first to make sure you're not overpaying for your fishing gear thank you so much to those guys for supporting the podcast letting us do what we do here can't thank them enough go support them www dot top fishing deals dot com all right as we said in the intro we have matt streichel on today's episode and we're going to switch it up a little bit this episode is going to be kind of out of our comfort zone here and we are going to talk about a different species now we're going to talk pretty heavily about musky in general but i think kind of the bigger picture of this episode is to think you know maybe it's not musky for you maybe it's catfish maybe it's walleye maybe it's pike maybe whatever it is i think the the gist of this episode is going to be there's a lot you can learn and a lot you can do to make yourself a better angler by you know stepping outside of your comfort zone and targeting a new species immersing yourself in something completely different instead of the normal old bass fishing that you do every single weekend you know switch it up it'll give you more tools in your tool belt it'll give you more knowledge Um, it'll just make you I think a more well-rounded angler so we're going to talk about that a lot in this episode so let's get right to it we have a very cool conversation with Matt Streichel all right, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by the one and only Matt Streichel. You guys know him as SB Fishing from YouTube. Matt, thanks for joining us, dude. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I want to preface this conversation by saying that I know 99% of you listening to this are bass anglers. We are a bass fishing podcast. But today we're going to talk a little bit about musky, and I wanted to bring Matt on specifically because, Matt, you're the guy that really inspired me about two or three years ago to chase these fish and to go after it after watching your videos And I just know that for me personally, the struggles, the obstacles, the challenges that these fish have really given me, I firmly believe have made me a better angler and and kind of more well-rounded. So I wanted to have a conversation with you and just kind of go over the lessons and maybe some advice for folks that are maybe interested in kind of dipping their toes in musky fishing. So before we dive into all that, do you want to give the folks a really quick crash course on kind of who you are, how long you've been doing the fishing YouTube game and, and kind of where you're from and things like that just to catch them up to speed? For sure. My name is Matt Streichel. I'm 29 years old. I've been fishing my entire life on and off heavily and less frequently, but I started doing YouTube about four years ago. And since I started doing YouTube again, I really have just been full-time fishing. Even when I was still working a full-time job, um, I was fishing all day and then I was bartending. So it was nice. So I'd wake up at four, go fish till 
four and then I'd go home, take a shower and go into the restaurant. So it was pretty Jeez. fun, but it was, it helped me get where I am today because if you have a normal nine to five, it's really hard to go out and fish, especially in the winter or spring when you don't have as much daylight. So it definitely helped, but they were long, long hours and long days. At what point along that journey did you take the step to say, hey, I'm going to do this full time and I'm really going to jump in and immerse myself and kind of, you know, set aside the other jobs and stuff and really dive in and live out of a van and everything else that you've been doing? So when I went full time, it was like January of 2018, I want to say, and I had a couple friends actually back me into it, which helped a ton. I couldn't have done it without them. So that was really the biggest push for me to do it was a couple good buddies that I used to play poker with. They kind of looked at it as an investment. They were like, Hey, we think you can make some money. We know that you'd love to do this full time. So here's six months to float and good luck. (laughs) That's basically how it went. So yeah, it was, it was very lucky, very, very lucky, but it was like, you know, all the steps in life and different things that I've done, like all add up to that moment of being able to do that. Like had I never played any poker or like met these guys who are very good friends now like it would have never worked out that way so i've always been kind of curious too you're not the only person that you know we've talked to or that i've heard along this journey that like made the switch from something like playing poker as a as a job to heading over and then taking that plunge and doing something like youtube where again i think you kind of have to have that in your dna of like hey you have the balls to sack up and do something non-traditional and something not safe because i know a couple weeks ago i think uh kyle welcher i was talking to kyle welcher who's an elite guy same thing came from a poker background so do you think that helped you at all yeah definitely with like some connections and just kind of my overall view of money like i just see it as a tool and you you know if you have money then you just invested in yourself basically that's what i do so yeah i mean i definitely think it's helped absolutely and i actually met kyle down in florida back in february and it was funny because i'd heard of him before a couple of buddies that pay really close attention to the elite stuff um you know he sent me this article like dude this guy was a poker player and he fishes on the elites and now he's you know he's like a youtuber as well and i was like man i gotta meet this guy he sounds awesome so <laughs> i met him down at Rodman Reservoir, and he's a super nice guy. Like, he was awesome to fish with. I, I mean, didn't even fish with him. I fished around him, but definitely bounced a lot off his head, and he helped me out with quite a few things. Super nice guy. Can't wait to fish with him. He kind of strikes me as a little bit like you, too, and, and I think one of the reasons that I like Kyle and I like watching his content and stuff, sort of the same reason I like watching yours, it's, it's really no frills fishing. It's not a whole lot of like, oh, let me go take a... a highly saturated picture in front of academy and do some you know 25 cent challenge in front of academy you know it's fishing it's real fishing and the one thing i've always appreciated from you from day one is like you show the struggle a lot of times and i think it's really easy to cut that stuff out and that's what we're going to get into here a little bit in musky was i think the reason that i fell in love with your musky videos was because you were showing that kind of like uncut here's 10 episodes in a row where I don't freaking catch a fish. And this is what fishing is really like. So um, I think that's really what endeared a lot of people to you right off the bat. And I appreciate that. So I guess I want to set up the stage for this conversation was I think you started YouTube probably what back in 2016, something like that. And then um, about a year later, you you were like a bass channel through and through. Um, And then about a year later, a video pops up that was titled like the hunt for the fish of 10,000 casts or something like that. It was just out of the blue musky video, like by yourself in a John boat in the middle of winter. Um, So from the beginning, as a bass guy, what made you want to kind of step out and target musky? So I was actually out on Burke Lake filming a bass fishing video. I was out there like ripping the A-rig around and doing all right. And there was only one other person out there that day. It was an older gentleman in a canoe with a trolling motor set up. And he was just trolling up and down the lake. And I saw him catch one muskie from, I was probably, I don't know, 400 to, we'll say 200 yards away. And I was like, damn, that's a big fish. Like, what is that? And I knew that muskie were in there, but I've personally never known anyone to specifically target them on this body of water. So I trolled over, talked to him a little bit, saw the fish. It was really sick. He was like, man, you can, they're not that hard to catch. Just come out here and troll around for him. He was trolling a storm flat stick in an A-rig just up and down from the dam to an island, maybe, you know, half a mile right through the channel, just up and down, up and down. And I think he caught two that day, actually. And that kind of sparked my interest. Like, man, he said it's pretty easy. Like, 
I would love to just catch one just to see what it's all about. I'm going to try it, but I want to catch one and catch them. So that's kind of what sparked the whole interest for me was seeing this gentleman out there catch two in a day and knowing that they're in this body of water and really having zero knowledge on the fish whatsoever besides that. It was just one of those things I was like, I want to catch one. I think it would be cool to try to film the entire thing from you know start to that first catch. Didn't think it would take as long as it did, but it was really cool. It was such an awesome experience. It helped the channel grow a ton at that time. And now I just, I love musky fishing, dude. Like it's, if I was a little bit more accessible to waters that had good musky fishing, I would do it a lot more. Yeah. You said it helped the channel grow and I know it did. Cause that was, I think that was the very first video I probably ever saw of yours and then started watching backwards was just that first musky video and you know, you're kind of intrigued. And, and the cool part was you kind of felt like you were on the journey with you because I was, I was a Midwestern kid that again, had a, we have a lake about an hour away that has some musky in it and you know what they are. You've heard of them before, but you don't know anything about them. You've just heard that they're insanely hard to catch, that they're tough, that there's all of this specialized knowledge that goes into it. And you just really did. You felt hooked into it because you were on that ride together. And then again, you showed the nine, 10 episodes where nothing was being caught and how grueling musky literally. fishing can be <laughs> literally nothing it, i can't even tell you how hard it is to make a video with no fish I'm like, it got to the point where i got somewhat decent at it and i was like man I can't believe i just made nine videos with not a single fish and i always get some hate on them like here and there but so many people were like please like keep posting these even if you don't catch anything like it's awesome like we want to keep watching until you catch one so like okay Right, we'll do it. And now looking back, like there's there's some sort of weird, twisted kind of like enjoyment you get out of watching someone else suffer as much as you do chasing the same fish. Like, OK, I'm not in this yeah. boat together. Like everybody who who starts out from ground zero just looks like a, you know, a, a total fool out there. I know I did for the first, what, probably six months that I tried to target this fish. I just looked like an absolute idiot out there because I didn't know any better. Um, so I remember watching that first video, you go out, you're chucking an A-rig, you're chucking a, I think like an X-Wrap or something like that, just, you know, kind of normal stuff like beefed up bass gear, which is what I think a lot of people get into musky and start doing is like, okay, I'm going to go get a, a 4.0 square bill or something and I'm going to go throw them out there. Do you remember anything like heading back in after day one and learning anything that day or having any sort of new appreciation for anything? Um, I can't say that I learned anything like heading back in that day, but I knew that once I posted the video, I was going to get quite a lot of, uh, you know, comments from people saying like, dude, you're an idiot. Like <laughs> what bass fisherman owns 80 pound leader? None. Like no one's using 80 pound leader for anything. People are like, man, you're going to, you know, you're going to break these fish off no matter what I'm throwing braid and 20 pound fluoro. And I was like, yeah, I've read people, you know, have caught these fish on 10 pound test. It's just like, you got to get lucky with that hook and hope it doesn't get in their mouth. That was kind of my drive at the beginning was just like, get out there and try to do it. Even if you don't catch anything, or even if you do get bit, whatever, just go and try to spend your day saying you're musky fishing, like tell yourself that's all you're after and dive in and go for it. And then I just progressed from there. I actually had someone from YouTube send me a rod after like that fourth or fifth video. He was like, I have this thing sitting around. Like, I'd love for you to try to use it and catch your first fish on it, which I did end up doing. Um, it was a Bass Pro Pete Mena um, musky rod. So that was sick. And then it just all grew from there. Like the people that I met through the comment section that like had so much influence on my musky fishing and some of my very good friends now because of those videos uh, taught me so much. And like just the opportunity to fish with some of the people that I've fished with and I've learned quite a bit, but yeah, that one first day, not much was going through my head. I was like, I'll wait and see what people say. I'll, I'll learn from them. And that was honestly that first fish that I ever caught was like, I owe it all to everyone who helped me out. It was pretty cool. Like I caught that fish because of YouTube. I can't say that. Oh yeah. I spent all these hours out there and I figured it out myself. Like, so many people had to do with that catch. So you said somebody sent you the rod. I think people were sending you baits left and right too, right? I think everybody, like yep. you said, everybody was just so invested in getting this kid yeah. to his first musky of like, dear God, some we have to to see this to fruition. So yeah, I, I remember yeah. that very well. And then, um, so I think when you let's fast forward, then when you finally caught the first one, I think you said you had like sixty something hours in it, something like that, before you finally got that first one in the boat. And it wasn't a giant one by any means, what probably thirty inch or something like that. Yeah, um, it was probably thirty inches, maybe. But to sum it up, first of all, if you've never seen the video, go watch 
SP fishing, I caught my first muskie because that's just the most like contagious uh excitement i think ever that I've, I've seen in a fishing video of just like so much relief so much anguish goes into one fish what did that first fish mean to you i mean it was probably close to 70 hours on the water in the winter like i think i caught it in march early march and i'd started doing it either late january or early february and i was fishing at least once a week for him so it was a lot of time on the water and like between in those 70 hours i think it wasn't until the last like 10 hours of we'll say 15 hours of being on the water that I'd actually seen a fish. So I found a spot on the Shenandoah. Someone recommended me try. And I remember going out there for the first time and I actually saw one just like sitting on the side of this rock, just leaned up against it for the heat. And I was like, Oh my God, that's what they look like. Like that's, that's it right there. Um, Oh yeah, I, catching that first one, it was at the very end of the day too, which was cool. After we saw a ton that day, I think we saw like individually, we probably saw ten fish, and we saw them multiple times throughout the day. But right as we get into that low light situation, um, I had a small one eat on a. I think I, it was a Kitek actually. I was throwing a Kitek on a swim jig or like a underspin kind of deal, just something small, and. Yeah, it just felt great. Like I was, it was jumping around, going crazy. I was very happy to get it in the net. And I just, my main thing was like, once I got it in the net, was like, make sure this fish is okay. It's my first one. Like, I don't want to kill it. I don't want to screw anything up. Yeah. Uh, and I read a lot about like handling musky, proper ways to hold them, things you should and shouldn't do. And I just wanted to make sure all of that was good. And then, you know, got some video, got a couple pictures. And then once it was released and swam off, I was just like, all right. <laughs> this is it. Like, so many, I really did feel that love from so many people that were watching and like following along with that chase that I was so excited to go home and like edit that video and post it and share that with everyone that you know, helped me catch that fish. So you can probably make the argument that it, it, what kept you going through that whole, you know, nine, 10 episode ordeal was like the actual chase of that first one and, and, you know, getting the carrot at the end of the stick. What was it afterwards that kept you chasing those fish? Was it their evasiveness? Was it the challenge? Was it the fight that it put up? What was it that kept you sticking around with Muskie? I think the biggest thing for me is I just love something that's so challenging. I, you know, I love bass fishing and it's, I think it's obviously, it's obviously easier to catch bass. You can go out and get a handful or, you know, catch 10, 15 fish. They may not be big. They may, you know, be big. It's just musky fishing is such a different animal. You go out for like one fish, if you, especially around here. If we go out and catch one, it's great. And it's like a, a team effort. You know, you fish with one other guy or a couple guys, and it doesn't matter who catches one. As long as it ends up in the boat, you're all stoked. Like you all are happy about it. And it's such a cool thing. It's so different than bass fishing. Like, if I'm fishing with Ace and he catches one, I'm like, all right, sweet. Like, that's awesome. If it's not a tournament and, or one of my buddies, whatever, it's like, awesome, got one. But when you, when you catch a muskie and you get it in the boat, everyone is, like, hyped. And everyone is feeling accomplished. So You're right. I think you can make the, the argument that it is a complete team sport. Like, I think I've been more nervous sometimes to net a fish than I have been when I've had the fish hooked like one you just don't want to be that guy right that your buddy's been exactly. casting for for 12 hours you know throwing his arm out and you finally hook one and you're the dude that misses it with the net like that's that would that would hurt me more than losing a fish like in the middle of the fight or something so i hear you there and what's funny is like i said you you definitely got me on the musky train and i think it was i think it was just watching your video watching the the emotion that you had catching that first fish i think i'd kind of watch it and was like i want that like i want i want to feel that same thing and i've never caught a bass really that's made me feel quite like that like yeah maybe your biggest bass ever was a big deal but I don't think anything that I, I had ever been that invested in and you know had that big of a challenge to go get so um, me and one of my buddies around here we live in central Ohio so we are in the the ass of all ass musky lakes like it's <laughs> you know we have yeah. um, we have one around here that's within 40 minutes of us that has musky in it it is definitely not a good lake it's chocolate milk all the time it's you know 300 more boats than there should be out every day they're insanely pressured it's hard but we decided we want to go out and target them we went out in our kayaks like idiots for the first two days with heavy bass gear 
didn't have the right net, didn't have, you know, anything to handle these fish. Had we hooked one, we were just, you know, so ill prepared. And me and my buddy's stories are completely different. He hooked a 46 and a half inch fish on the second day we went out. Um, in his 10 foot sun dolphin kayak. Uh, and luckily it was a good Samaritan that was passing by and was like, y'all need some help. And we're like, dear God, yes. So he had to stand up in his sun dolphin, jump to the other boat and land it in the boat. Cause again, we're just, we now looking back, we're like, I don't believe how stupid we were to, to go out and target these without the right net, without the right tools. Dude, to I did the sleep. exact same thing though. Like that's how I feel like you start. You, <laughs> you don't have this appreciation for them until, you know, you've done it a few times or you read a bit or watch some videos on it. I didn't like, I was in the exact same boat as you. I went out on birth Lake with an a rig and like, yeah, Rapala, whatever jerk bait it was. And, uh, my bass net, like, oh, I'll get its head in there and I'll try to grab its tail. Right. Which, not how it works. <laughs> which is not at all how it works. Like, what am I going to do after that? Just get it in the boat, let it flop around and kill itself? And no. But, like, I look back now and thank God I didn't catch one. <laughs> it was yep. the worst. Yep. So then on my side, full disclosure, I had probably three to four hundred hours into my first fish. Like, I'm not kidding. It was a year and a half, two years of... 3 a.m. getting up, getting on the lake before any boat is out there to get to the spot to chuck for, you know, 12 hours a day to not catch a fish. And then last fall, finally landed my first one. And I finally got that that rush and that feeling that you're chasing. And then you're right. Then it goes to that was almost addicting. Like now I'm almost a sucker for the punishment of like going out and, you know, having those tough days. Because again, you don't, it's like a luxury that you don't get to have with bass. If you go out and you have a a day where you get skunked in bass, it's not a, oh, I'm so happy for the challenge. It's a screw this. I don't, you know, this is not what I signed up for. For sure. Um, But one of the things I think I took away from the whole thing was obviously the persistence, you know, you have to endure to, to go out and actually target these fish. And I think I was able to apply that to especially bass fishing and some other things and really put stuff in perspective of like you know okay i might be having a bad day bass fishing but it is not nearly the challenge that some other stuff is so can you think of anything that you've taken away from musky fishing like whether it be a kind of an intangible or something that you've then been thankful for and been able to apply to all the rest of your fishing yeah absolutely i mean the persistence of it like you just said and i mean i've been recently getting more into throwing bigger swim baits for bass and I look at it like musky fishing. Like I'm able to take a day and say, I'm only going to go out and throw big swim baits. And it's very easy for me to do that because I'm, I'm so used to musky fishing now where I've gone out and not even seen a fish in 12 hours or 14 hours and, you know, really busted my ass with buddies and like neither of us have seen a fish. So when I take away the musky side of it and, bring that kind of like big swim bait game into play in the bass fishing game. It's, it's like the exact same thing. It's really cool. And it's really helped me to be able to do that because there's definitely been times in the past, say like at the start of the musky stuff, when I've wanted to do full swim bait days and I'm out for like a couple hours throwing giant swim baits and not seeing anything. I'm like, okay, I'm going to pick up a jig or a shaky head and catch a couple and then go back to the swim bait. And I just stick with the jig or shaky head because they're biting me. Yeah. It's a very easy thing to do. It's like I'd rather catch fish than not, but now it's a little bit different where throwing those bigger swim baits is a lot easier. Like I don't care if I catch anything or not. I'm out here to do this and learn this. Absolutely. And I can think of like even some little stuff I think that's kind of helped me along the way for bass. Like one of the things that I started doing I almost subconsciously after I started musky fishing a whole lot, obviously you get it ingrained in your brain that like your cast does not end right when you get to the boat and just pull up. Like obviously musky fishing, you're figure eighting. There's a lot of emphasis on if something is following it to capitalize on that. And I've actually taken that to my bass fishing a little bit where it's like you're throwing a crank, you're throwing a spinnerbait, you're throwing something that's a straight retrieve. And there's a small chance that we've all seen bass follow something to the boat before of like getting in the habit of either killing it or giving it a twitch or giving it a pop or something, some misdirection right before you get to the boat. And I've caught a handful of bass just kind of applying that same thing. And I, it all started from musky fishing. Where it was like, they're not the only fish that just follows stuff to the boat and you pull it out of the water before they get a chance to really commit to it. So little stuff like that, I think is, is interesting and it, it kind of bridges different species of fishing. Yeah, absolutely. And the other bit of that I can definitely agree with is, you know, after a few days of musky fishing and you're like figure eight and after every single cast, if I go back to bass fishing, I will catch myself literally like yeah. starting to go into a figure eight. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? But um, <laughs> yeah, I've definitely fallen into that same pattern as you. 
killing baits at the end of the cast or, you know, even doing like a little L turn or something. And especially with bass, because they use the surface of the water as cover, you know, they'll chase bait up because they have nowhere further to go. So like if I'm fishing a scrounger or something, a lot of times I'll catch that fish. If this is the boat, you're bringing your bait up to the boat. They'll eat it right here at the surface because that's its last second to eat it. And it's also a piece of cover they can basically use to pin them against is the surface of the water. So you kind of hang it there for that last second point. It's a lot of fun. All right, we're going to get back to our conversation with Matt in just a second. But first, I have a quick message from Dark Horse Tackle. Dark Horse Tackle is an awesome new monthly subscription service that's rethinking the way the fishing industry does monthly subscription boxes. So I know you've seen subscription boxes all over the internet. You're thinking, how is this one different than the other five or ten that are out there? Unlike all those other subscription boxes, Dark Horse Tackle boxes are full of high-quality, small-batch, custom baits that are delivered right to your doorstep each and every month. Every single bait in the Dark Horse Tackle Box is handpicked from a U.S.-based tackle company, so it's a really cool way for you guys to find new companies, new lures to like, without you know it being the same lures that you're seeing on your Bass Pro shelf or your Cabela's shelf or your Walmart shelf. Really, there's only a couple ways to find these companies. It's going to be you luckily stumble upon them online, or you get them in your Dark Horse Tackle Box. So again, a cool way to support these local honest kind of guys making stuff, real small runs, custom stuff in the USA. Again, you've heard me say it, the quality control, the components that go into these, the design, the paint jobs, everything on these custom small batch lures are second to none compared to those like, you know, big box store brands that you're used to seeing or those places over in China that are pumping out 10,000 baits an hour. These are totally different. These are baits you're going to use and you're going to love. So head over to www.darkhorsetackle.com to check out their subscriptions. They're super affordable. I think the lowest one's about seven bucks a month. The highest one goes up to like 25. Uh, but if you go over there and you use the code Tackle Talk. 30. Just for being a Tackle Talk listener, you are going to save 30% on your entire order with Dark Horse Tackle. Again, head over to www.darkhorsetackle.com and use code TACKLETALK30 at checkout for 30% off. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Matt Streichel. So if anybody's listening to this and they are kind of interested in stepping out of their comfort zone and maybe trying a different species, obviously, I think both of us would probably recommend musky as a fun kind of challenge to go after that that can make you a more well-rounded angler and make you appreciate some of the days that you have bass fishing, too. Um, so I kind of want to get into some some actual musky specific questions and for people that are listening that, you know, might be interested in just beefing up their knowledge a little bit. First, for for setups, obviously, we both started out with basically bass setups and, you know, you quickly realize that can you catch fish on those? Yes. Do people catch fish on, you know, I was just throwing a, a 1.5 and I caught a 50 inch musky. It's like, but that's not really the, the right way to give yourself the best chance of landing a fish. So what is your go-to right. musky setup? I guess if you had someone out there that was looking at investing in one setup, kind of an all around the seven foot medium heavy bait caster of the bass world, uh, what would you recommend to those people as, as far as size and power? So I have currently, I use an eight foot six chaos tackle assault stick. Um, it's like a, I guess in, in musky world it's like a medium heavy rod it's meant for like bucktails and like gliders and small rubbers honestly i'm perfectly fine with throwing everything up to like the regular size medusa and really big bucktails on there um and i throw some of the bigger gliders too it really just comes down to you being able to like get used to lobbing the really really heavy baits like some of those gliders that I'm throwing around that my buddy um, Dennis or DJ Customs makes, they're like 10 ounces. They're huge. And this rod is rated up to like six. But yeah, that's, I mean, I've used bigger rods as well, like in the nine foot range. Those are really great too. It makes it a lot easier to figure eight, especially if you're a tall guy. I'm, I'm a really small dude. I'm like five, five. So that's pretty simple for me. But for dudes that are six foot or bigger, like with a small rod, they got to really like hunch over and for the eight. Um, so that's where I think those bigger rods come into play. And also when you're throwing giant baits, like big rubber pounders and stuff like that, like the guys up North are throwing, that's when you need something super, super heavy. But yeah, I think that eight, six medium heavy from chaos tackle is pretty sweet. I really like it. I've been using it for the last two years and I've got quite a few fish on it too. Never felt underpowered. 
I'm the same way. I'm, I'm running a medium heavy most of the time in a, in a, in again, in the musky world, that's a broomstick in, in bass terms, but right. Um, yeah. If you tell a bass guy, this is a medium heavy. They're like, get out of here, dude. Right. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, you're going to whip a generator around on this? No. Yeah. This is a dowel rod, but the past, you know, couple year, year and a half, probably I've been throwing just an eight foot. I think eight to eight, six is, is right in that sweet spot for most people. Um, I just throw one of the cheap, like bulldog rods, the, the $99 yeah. ones that, from Muskie Innovations. Sure. And it does fine. Again, I'm a shorter dude too. So I don't need a, a nine foot stick really most of the time. Um, but as far as real size and, and line, what are you usually running? Are you running like a three or 400 size reel or, and then what's your braid situation like? So I'm using a Tranks 300. A lot of guys suggest going with the Tranks 400. I think for my style of fishing and the general fishing that I'm doing as far as the river goes, like we're making short casts. Like we're not sitting out in the middle of St. Clair making these bomb casts with pounders. We're throwing small, like bucktails and glides that are going to be more pinpoint casts. Like you're trying to get it. Into the, into the nook of a tree and like pull it out. So I, did, I didn't think I'd need more than 100 yards of line. I'm never going to cast that far. So right. the 300 is smaller, it's lighter, it's going to be a little bit easier for me. So that's what I have on there, the Trank 300. And then I also have a Daiwa Lexa 300, which my buddy Dennis hooked me up with a couple years ago. So those are my two reels, 300 size. But a lot of guys do go with the 400 over it. It's a little bit bigger than that 300, obviously. It's going to hold more line. But I've been perfectly fine with 300. I haven't seen any situation where I would have been like, oh, I really wish that I had the 400 right now. But I'm sure that situation could arise here. If I'm like up north throwing giant, giant baits, I can see the argument for that. But for me and my normal fishing, uh, the 300 has been perfect. And as far as the braid goes, I'm throwing 80-pound power pro. And then to either a 80 or 100 pound fluorocarbon leader or sometimes a steel leader. Got it. And yeah, I can vouch for that Lexa too. That's the reel that I use, that 300 WN. And I mean, for whatever, you can find them on sale for like 120 bucks or something. Like it's a, it's a yeah. solid reel. And it can also double as a bass reel if you want to use it for a big swim bait reel or something too. There's nothing that says you can't. So really versatile. Um, so cool. And that's, I'd say that's a, a pretty good suggestion there. So if you're listening and you're interested in getting into this somewhere in that, you know, eight, six medium heavy range, get you a 300 size casting reel, throw some heavy braid on there, anywhere from 65 to 80, put a big leader on there and you've at least got the tools to go out and do this the right way. Um, where do you stand in terms of like something that, you know, I, I didn't even know about before I started musky fishing was moon phases. I didn't pay attention to moon phases. You know, I thought it was a load of horse crap. It was the, the, the horoscopes, the stuff you see in the, the newspaper. Like, I just didn't believe it. Um, and then slowly but surely musky fishing has made me a believer in moon phases. Where do you stand on majors, minors, and how that dictates how you're fishing that day? So for me, I fish when I can. That's the thing. It doesn't matter what the moon phase is or what the majors or minors are. Obviously, I'm going to look at them when I'm going musky fishing just because it's something fun to do, in my opinion. Um, but it's been explained to me a couple different times in a couple different ways. So if you have a lake that you're fishing that has seen pretty sustained weather for like a couple weeks or like a week at a time, that's when the majors and minors are really going to come into play. I think when you have like big cold fronts coming through or whatever you have rain or like storms coming, that's going to be more important than the majors and minors in moon phase because they're going to obviously react to the fronts coming in. But if you have this long period of sustained weather, then you can be like, okay, we're going to look at these majors and minors. And this is when they're really going to start reacting in these time periods. Um, and I, I can totally see that and believe that, but there's been times, I mean, where, We've been out on the river and, you know, a couple of our spots, like we catch fish during the minor, like that's when we catch fish here. It's during the minor. It seems to always add up that it's during these small, like two hour windows where, you know, we've been out for eight hours and haven't seen anything. And then, all right, minors coming in and, oh, just had a follow. Oh, just had another follow. Oh, caught a fish. And then we see one more and then the end of the minor, it's done. So I definitely believe that it has some bit of play, but I mean, I'm fishing regardless. That's the thing. I still think you can make these fish react like bass. I still think that you can have that one off that'll still bite, but 
I, I do believe that it is a tool that you should keep in your back pocket, but otherwise, yeah, get out, fish all day, bust your ass. That's interesting. So the way you look at it then is more of like a secondary piece of information then. You're going with fronts, barometric pressure, weather first, and then if if basically that is, is not showing any sort of signs of like when to target, then moon phases may come in a little bit more important. That's interesting because that's what made me a believer in it was you'll have these days where, you know— traditional bass knowledge says okay if they're like bass they should be hitting close to dawn close to dusk you know they'll have a little time where they turn on a 30 minute window and then it'll be done and it should be sometime early in the morning and sometime late at night and there have been times where we've been out on the lake at 3 a.m we've been fishing hard up to sunrise after sunrise and then it'll be like noon and they just turn on and then you'll look at it and be like oh we were in a major or we were in a minor or whatever it is so i yeah I, I just don't know how to fully uh, figure it out yet, but I do believe that it, it makes some difference. It's just a matter of how much and when. Yeah. I mean, so that's then, like the age-old yeah. question. You know, I was just going to say, it's like, you got to fish when you can. That's what it all comes down to. And I actually just listened to another podcast called K- uh, Casting Crank, and Butch Brown, like, he's a huge swim baiter. I don't know if you've heard of him or not, but he's like, he's like the goat. Butch Brown, like the, the HUD godfather. Yeah. And he said... He only catches his big fish basically when that moon is just coming up or it's gone down and it's like during the day. So if the moon's out during the day, he's not, he has not, he doesn't catch any big fish and he has like over 510 plus pounders on film. So he has the, um, like he has the, the source, he has all the data that he needs. And he's never, like, he doesn't catch them when the moon is out during the day. I would be like, yeah, I'm going to throw a jig instead of a swim bait when the moon is out. But I personally don't have that sample size of musky fishing to say, like, I only catch them in the minor. I only catch them in the major. So I still do. I I think it it is a tool. But like you, I I don't know how to fully utilize it. And whatever days I can go fish, I'm going to go fish for from sunup to sundown. Yep. I think you just probably look at it like it's one of the 50 pieces of the puzzle and it's not, you know, some of those pieces aren't more or less important than others. You need all of them to put together the picture. It's just a matter of, you know, I don't know, trying, trying to prioritize them. I think it's tough sometimes. Um, so I guess one of the things I wanted to talk about too is I know for me specifically, the musky water that I target is extremely pressured. I'm talking like these poor fish get teabagged all day long. Like it's terrible. Um, have you seen any tactics where you fished, you know, that work maybe a little bit better in pressured water versus unpressured water? Like there's some really conventional bass wisdom, right? That says downsize, slow down, take away rattles, things like that to, to make it a little bit more subtle and, and, you know, hopefully entice fish that are a little bit more pressured. Have you found anything like that for musky? Personally, no, because I, yeah, I, I, again, I don't fish as much as I would like to for musky and I haven't, really targeted them enough to say like, okay, this is what I did to catch these super pressured fish. So I I have no suggestions for you on that one, though. I would love to hear some answers. That would be right. pretty sweet. Um, but I can imagine if, you know, in some situations you're, you're throwing smaller baits, like you're not throwing these giant Medusas or glides, like you downsize to a Rapala jerk bait, like what their Husky jerk or something like that, or something even along the size of like a, a bass lure, like a bass jerk bait, a lucky craft or something like that, that you're just giving a shot. I've seen it. I've seen that work. Actually, I was fishing with Robbie and Lee of today's angler and we were fishing early spring and Robbie's throwing a spinning rod or no, it was throwing a bait caster, but it had like 50 pound braid to, I want to say a 60 pound fluorocarbon leader with uh, like directly tied. There's no swivel, there's no snap. And then directly to, um, I want to say it was a like a five inch husky jerk, and he had the most action out of any of us that day. He caught the only fish. So, but it's just so strange throwing these really small baits for musky. I know it works. Like I've seen guys do it with bass jigs and stuff like that. But for me, when I'm musky fishing, I want to be throwing something big. That's the same thing with me. It almost feels like a cop out if I'm going to go out and I'm going to throw a husky jerk or I'm going to throw a you know 1.5 or something for these fish. It's like. No, like I feel like I should know what I'm doing more to be able to to I I bought 
hundreds of dollars worth of baits. I want to use those baits. I don't want to go out and throw a, an X wrap for them. But, you know, you're right. Sometimes you have to swallow your pride. And it's a matter of like, do you want to put more fish in the boat or do you want to, you know, sit there and, and think you're better than everybody else and throw, you know, a, a right. giant Medusa all day long? It, it, it takes some time to swallow your pride sometimes. That's at least what I'm finding. Absolutely. I mean, the other day I was up fishing Burke Lake. We were bass fishing and my friend Billy hooked into like an absolute giant of a muskie on a scrounger with a fluke on it. Like, the, honestly, one of the biggest muskie I've ever seen. It broke his line after like 10 seconds, but I was freaking out. I was like, I have no idea what we're going to do. I don't know how we're going to land this fish. It's the biggest fish i ever seen. And then popped and I'm like, almost relieved. Like, <laughs> right, you don't I'm have to. Glad, but but also not because I really wanted to get that fish to the boat. I think it, so that lake record right now is like 26 pounds, 26 and a half pounds. And I guarantee that that fish that he hooked was a lot bigger than that. It was high forties, low fifties musky. And I mean, just for how broad it was, its head came up, couldn't make it all the way out of the water. It was so big. It just thrashed around on the surface for a second. Its head was what seemed to be, you know, 12 inches across. And it was a huge, huge musky. I was, I lost my uh, lost my shit on that one. I was like, "We got to go back. We got to we got to chase her." That's the frustrating part about these fish too is that it it hurts your pride a lot when you see like around here there will be someone that'll be out white bass fishing throwing a number one white meps and hooks a you know forty three inch muskie. Meanwhile, you're out there thinking you know what you're doing with the right gear, the right lures, the right everything. You've watched a million hours of video, you've done all your research, and the old guy throwing a cream worm off the dock catches a muskie and you get no action all day. And it's like, it's kind of the same thing as like if you would get, you know, your butt whooped by someone that's throwing a, a night crawler under a bobber during a bass fishing tournament. It's like, you know, you don't want to say it, but you're like, I know what I'm doing more than you. I should be able to target these fish better than you do. But that's what's frustrating about them is that some days they'll just bite the dumbest stuff and they won't even sniff your $40 lure that you put all the research in the world into buying. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's definitely frustrating. And those fish, that's why they're unicorns, man. They're just, they can be assholes. That's what it comes down to. Is like they are some of the most frustrating fish that I have ever tried to catch. Hands down. They are they do what they want. They're the apex predator. They don't need to eat. And then when they want to eat, they'll eat whatever they want. They'll follow your bait just to look at it. Like they'll, with no intention of ever eating it. Out of nowhere, too. They'll come right by oh, your yeah. boat and just give you a roll and say, what's up? I've been here for the past half hour and you suck too bad to catch me and then be gone yep. for another two hours. Um, so one thing I want to talk about, too, obviously, we're in that kind of fall transition time frame right now. Um are there any lures that you kind of look at as a go-to in the fall, whether it's bulldogs or blades or jerks, cranks, something like that? Is there something that you have more confidence in the fall versus other times of year? I think that really just depends on where I'm fishing, like... I know that a lot of people that fish lakes or maybe even up, up north will say, you know, fishing a glider is definitely like a winter bait. I fish glides pretty much all year round if I'm in a river. Like something about throwing a glider in a river is so money when you're up against like a down tree or something like that. It just has so much drawing power and those fish just want to come out and either smoke it or just look at it. And like then you, from there you try to get them to eat. But yeah, I love throwing gliders in the fall. Uh, definitely rubbers too. And if it's like, if you're seeing active fish, definitely throw in a bucktail. That's actually something else that I've read, even in the coldest of water that you can fish guys are like, if you're seeing fish move and they're active, like throw a bucktail, even if it's 40 degrees, throw a bucktail. Like if they're being active, active, they're going to chase it and they're going to eat it. So that's something I'm definitely going to try a little bit more this fall, but yeah, fall bite. Because it goes against everything we've been taught as bass anglers. That's what's really frustrating sometimes is like we've always kind of looked at, at muskie as like a lot of the muskie that we've caught have been off structure, um, just off of down trees, off of stuff. And we just keep looking at it and we keep thinking that we're overthinking it sometimes and that they're just big bass. Like, And then you have the times of year where it's the winter time and they go out and they sit in the middle of the lake suspended with no uh, structure as far as the eye can see, nothing. And they just sit there and kind of float around. So... Again, if you're listening to this and you want a challenge and you want to <laughs> so bang true. your head against the wall a lot of times, but also have maybe the most rewarding fish to catch of your life, go after musky. So that kind of brings us to 
our last question here. You hinted at it a little bit at the beginning of the episode about safe handling of muskie. I think that's something that for novices a lot of times gets overlooked, at least the importance of it, or you get mixed information on, on what you should do and how you should handle this fish. If someone's going to go out tomorrow and target muskie for the first time, what is the kind of basic advice you're going to give them as far as like, okay, you have the fish hooked, now what, from the time fish is hooked until it is back safely in the water to make sure that you are releasing that fish as strong as you caught it? So first thing I also like to bring up is the reason that we use such big rods and such heavy gear is to literally horse that fish in and get it into the net as quickly as possible because the less time that fish is fighting, the less lactic acid it's going to build up, the more, the easier it's going to be to release that fish. Like you don't want to fight a muskie for 20 minutes that it will kill itself. It's literally what it comes down to. You want to hook the fish, get it into the bag as quick as you can, and then at this point, you're looking at the net. You want a net big enough to hold a fish up to 50 inches. You know, I mean, hopefully one day, right? But yeah, right. <laughs> even for the smaller ones, even for a 40 inch muskie, you want something that's going to fit in the net and that you can very, you know, carefully just leave off the side of the boat and allow that fish to chill. If the fish is unhooked and in the net, it's fine. Like it's right. not hurting it. It's breathing. It's chilling. So, which is something that we'll do a lot, especially when we have to deal with. You know, you want to get video, you want to kind of plan everything out, you want to quick get a bump on the fish, get some video of it, put it back in the net, like let it chill, pull it back out for a quick picture, and then you go for the release. So as long as you have that net sitting on the side, it's basically like a live ball for it. You want to have a net big enough for the fish. Um, As far as tools, get some very long needle nose pliers, because when you have a bucktail or a glider in that fish's mouth, and it's thrashing around or rolling, like you do not want to be connected to that. You do not want to get hooked when you have a fish with a lure in its mouth. That's actually one of like my biggest fears. I have seen some horror stories and bad pictures of it. So definitely some long needle nose. Um, A lot of guys use jaw spreaders too, which are good. I don't suggest boga grips, though I have seen some friends use um, the boga grips that swivel. So the biggest thing, yeah, like if you have, you know, the plastic grips that like are on scale sometimes yeah. that close down, it, they have zero spin to it. So if you have one of those hooked onto the muskie's bottom lip and you're trying to unhook it and decides to go into a death roll, it's, it's literally going to rip the fish's jaw, which we caught a fish that had that happen to it last uh, March or February. It had a completely split lower jaw, which looked like this, and I've never seen it. I was like, what the hell? And my buddy Sam that I was with, pointed out like this is from either you know straight boga grips or one of those plastic clamps that people put on here to unhook them or to hold them because they don't really understand the proper way to do it but uh, i have seen people use the swiveling boga grips i think that in some cases they're absolutely necessary like if a fish really gets a bait deep you have to pin that bottom lip otherwise it's super hard just to get in there and fully take care of that fish and I think besides those things, um, as far as just holding the fish, never hold it vertically. And that's about it. I mean, when you go to pick it out of the bag, obviously you're going to support its belly and then boom, straight to being horizontal. And I've been doing the tail grip lately. My buddy Sam Scott of Blue Ridge Muskie is like real big on the tail grab. You just hold the tail, scoop your hand under its belly, and then you lift it out head first, get a nice shot back in the net. And I've also heard guys say, when you go to pick the muskie up out of the bag, you want to pick it up so its head is facing the water towards the net instead of into it, into the boat. So if it does start going crazy, you just boop, throw him in the water. He's good instead of dropping him in the boat head first and just doming him. That makes a lot of sense. I've, I've seen that quite a bit of you think you have a good grip on this fish. You go for the, all right, I'm going to hold it out of the water for five seconds, get a picture and take it out. And as soon as that fish comes fully out of the water, poof, or straight down on the boat or something. And again, just common sense stuff that I think you don't see enough of and you don't hear a lot of people tell you enough of. They just think, oh, you have to have a big net, treat it carefully and get it back in the water. It's like there's a lot of nuances to handling a fish right, to getting your your hand placement right when you are going to go hold it. And some of that stuff... I don't think you can fully explain just telling someone you really have to handle a fish or two uh, you have the first couple it. times. Yeah, you absolutely have to do it. Like, I'll tell you, I was, I mean, the first musk I ever caught, I was like, I'm going to hold it for a picture. Like, I want it. I want to feel this fish. I want it in my hands, and I want to do it right. But 
you know, I'm obviously scared of sticking my hand up in this thing's jaw and never having done it before. They have rows of what I like to describe it as like Velcro for teeth. And it's yeah. insane. They have like thousands of little sharp, razor sharp teeth. So, and when they get bigger, it's even more sketchy because once you do get that grip, your, your hand is literally laying right below one of those patches of razor sharp teeth. So, yep. And their gill plates. Oh, their gill plates are super sharp too. Yeah. 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 Again, it's, it's one of those things. It, it helps if you're going to go out, if you have the opportunity to go out with someone that at least knows what they're doing more than you do to, to yeah. teach you hands on the first way. Um, otherwise, I just think you have to be as careful as possible. Know all of the stuff that you've been taught and and you know if you mess up a little bit the first fish or two as long as you're doing it like you said hold the the face facing the net so if something goes wrong it goes in the net or at worst case scenario it goes in the water without you getting a picture but at least it goes back to where it's supposed to instead of being dropped on five treble hooks in your boat so i'm right with you there so i just want to thank you for taking some time and coming on and talk with us today really appreciate it before we let you go do you want to let the folks know that are listening where they can find you keep up with you you got anything coming up on the horizon yeah, absolutely. Actually, I have a ton of musky content coming out on my YouTube channel over the next month and a half or so. Um, you can check me out on SB Fishing TV on YouTube. A couple other quick shout outs. Uh, one of my very, very good friends, Dennis Johns, uh, DJ Custom Baits. He makes some of the sickest gliders and diving rises and whatever else you could imagine with the craziest paint jobs. Uh, look him up on Facebook, DJ Customs. And then Sam Scott of Blue Ridge Musky. If you guys are looking for a musky guide and I would say pretty much a guaranteed fish, fish in the James River down there in uh, southwest Virginia. I can say that that is definitely the place I've seen the most musky in my life. Every trip we're seeing like 10 to 15 and hooking a few. He is the man. So look up uh, Blue Ridge Musky and he will take you out for a very fun musky trip. I can assure you that. That's all I got. Hey, well, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to come and talk with us. That was Matt Streichel of SB Fishing. Thanks, man. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2020. Please subscribe to Tackle Talk on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 